Welcome to another episode of Follow the Brand. I am your host, Grant McGaw, CEO of Five Star BDM, a five star personal branding and business development company. I want to take you on a journey that takes another deep dive into the world of personal branding and business development using compelling personal story, business conversations, and tips to improve your personal brand. By listening to the Follow the Brand podcast series, you will be able to differentiate yourself from the competition and allow you to build trust with prospective clients and employers. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Make it one that will set you apart, build trust, and reflect who you are. Developing your five-star personal brand is a great way to demonstrate your skills and knowledge. If you have any questions for me or my guests, please email me at grant.magaw, spelled M-C-G-A-U-G-H, at 5 star BDM, B for brand, D for development, M for masters.com. Now let's begin with our next five star episode on Follow the Brand. Hello, and welcome to another episode on the Follow the Brand podcast. We have a special edition on technology innovation featuring Ian McHale. Did you know artificial intelligence machines have an IQ of 10,000 while the most intelligent human has an IQ of about 150? Ian McHale does. McHale is an author, speaker, inventor, and founder of Infinite 8 Institute. A specialist in medical imaging, artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, and blockchain technology mentored at a young age and he started public speaking through the national mentoring partnership as a child he shared the stage with well-known personalities like hill harper and oprah winfrey ian follows the eight principles of his company infinite Eight institute which include self-responsibility self-discipline persistence foresight humility fearlessness character, and excellence. Constantly bettering yourself, accepting failure as something positive, and failing forward are his models. Mikhail was the first person to train the IBM Watson supercomputer on artificial intelligence on how to recognize human emotion. Ian says creating with an entrepreneurial mindset will make tech business ownership a priority and turn our ideas into assets. Ian McHale has partnered with and consulted organizations such as IBM, Oracle, Bain and Company, McKinsey, NVIDIA, and Amazon and brings deep expertise in AI and healthcare technology. He regularly provides market evaluations for global expert networks with clientele including big three consulting firms, Fortune 100 firms, venture capital groups, and others. Ian has served as the principal investigator and sponsor of preclinical and clinical trials for cutting-edge technologies in the life sciences. Additionally, Ian sits on the board of advisors as a shareholder of a telehealth company, is a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Trustees, and has managed budgets as high as $1 million dollars development of human and machine resources for life science applications. Ian co-facilitates healthcare-related coursework at MIT on robotics and digital transformation in partnership with Emeritus. Let us welcome Ian McHale to the Follow the Brand podcast, where we are building a five-star brand that you can follow. Welcome, everyone. And I want to definitely bring you up to speed on what we're doing during the technology and innovation series. I want to showcase different entrepreneurs, different thought leaders, different scholarly people who are advancing our technological footprint at at a high level. My next guest, Ian, Ian is going to be on our, uh, another association I'm a part of, which is HIMSS, that does a lot with health, IT, 
innovation. He's going to talk about robotics and the robotic process automation in the healthcare arena. That's going to be on June 23rd. And I want to preface everybody. I want my audience in South Florida to get to, 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 to understand who Ian is. That's why we're doing this podcast. I found out later that Ian is from my hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. And I am so, so proud of that. And before I keep rambling on, I want you to that Ian, go ahead and introduce himself. I'm going to get going and really talk about what he's doing at a high level. So, Ian, take the mic. All right. So, thanks, Grant, for having me on Follow the Brand. Uh, definitely, I've been following your work and uh, definitely can't say enough about, you know, the, the work that you put in and the quality of, of the output. And so, so, my name, once again, is Ian McHale, and I am the principal uh, engineer of Infinite 8 Institute. And we specialize in cutting edge research and development, as well as workforce training uh, from pre-K all the way through workforce ready. Uh, we also have an ecosystem. Uh, we also have a commercial side, Infinite Aid Industries, which specializes on taking R&D from our Infinite Institute and commercializing it in the fields of artificial intelligence, uh, as well as uh, medical imaging. And then we have a philanthropic arm uh, which is the Quantum Coin Foundation, which focuses on educating uh, young people and future generations about blockchain technology. I tell you, you have a storied life. And before we even get into the technological part of your life, I mean, you impressed me because you ran for mayor. That is correct. You, you were serious about this. I mean, how, so tell us about a little bit about your 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 upbringing, how you got into the political arena and how you kind of pivoted into this technology field. Absolutely. Um, so I probably couldn't start talking about my story without talking about um, towards the beginning. Uh, when I was four years old, um, there was an incident, a domestic violence incident between my mother and my father. And I witnessed my father killed uh, due to gun violence uh, at the age of four. And so after that, you know, my mother was um, was deep into uh, drugs, uh, et cetera. I moved around a lot, bounced around a lot. Um, however, I was into, um, I did get involved in mentoring at a young age uh, where I became the national spokesperson for Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. Uh, and so, you know, the organization had individuals uh, like Jeff Boise, um, who he sold his financial organization to Goldman Sachs for like half a million, I mean, for like half a billion dollars um, in the 2000s. And um, uh, and they came on as a partner for Goldman Sachs. Ray Chambers, uh, who was the co-founder um, of uh, the National Mentoring Partnership, he was CEO of Bear Stearns when um, the Lehman Brothers went under. So Bear Stearns was like the second or third uh, bank to go under in 08. And so um, these were the individuals that you know, I was around um, through the organization. I was able to speak at venues like uh, Viacom headquarters in Times Square. I was able to meet Oprah. Um, as a result, Hill Harper, different individuals like that. Um, so, you know, I've been doing this public speaking thing for actually over 20 years. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's unique and it brings a unique perspective. This is this is before social media. Right. Like I was doing this before social media, before any of this was around. And the only way that we could do this was to do it in person. And so, you know, to see the technology progress, of course, we've had to progress as well. Um, I I started working for myself around 2013 is when we started the organization, uh, Infinite Aid Institute. And, um, you know, at that point in time, I had just worked for the Urban League of Nebraska for about a year, giving back to the community. Um, I had come out of law school, um, but wanted to go into business uh, as opposed to just focusing primarily on law. And so um, skydiving, so to say, in 2013, um, you know, I began that that journey. Uh, one of the first things that we did was um, we went on a tour called Poverty of the Mind and we we uh, toured eight cities in eight days. And so we were in Omaha. We were in uh, St. Louis. We were in Atlanta. Uh, the Raleigh Durham area. We we're in Charlotte, um, DC. We hit Detroit and Chicago, right? In eight days. And so we just had, like, um, for example, 
Um, one thing that I always wear for my organization are these different wristbands, right? Um, and they say one of our eight principles. So uh, either self-discipline, self-responsibility, persistence, fearlessness, excellence, foresight, character, or humility. And since about 2012, I actually, I've been practicing this system myself where I focus on a different um, character trait each week. And, you know, that way I try to become better. And I can say, um, you know, that, that it has taken me quite far. So in 2016, like you discussed, um, I was the first African-American male in the history of uh, Omaha, Nebraska to run for, for mayor. Um, you know, we did it with a bootstrap budget, right? We had about 15 grand and we ran up against uh, Stother, who at the time had a, um, a war chest of about 1.5 million. Um, and so we did make it to primaries. We didn't make it through primaries, um, but we were able to make history uh, in the process and open the door, um, you know, for future possibilities as well. And so with that being said, I mean, that took a lot of um, a lot of learning on the fly uh, in order to do that. Um, subsequently, after that, I started coding, like maybe within a year after running uh, and I wanted to create applications for drone technology primarily. And uh, I didn't know necessarily, like I didn't know how to code. And there wasn't a lot of people in the Omaha area that knew about low level languages that are required to essentially create software for machines. Um, right now, there's a, there's a lot of people who know about like certain software languages like a Java, et cetera, that are used for building uh, simple productivity applications, um, you know, user interface designs, but they're not really meant for low level um, robotic control, like controlling a drone. And so I had to kind of essentially learn these different languages myself. And then once I started learning them, I started training other people on these technologies. And then that's when our organization took off. And, um, you know, we broke a million dollars in 2019 uh, as well. And so, you know, that's something that I also will um, give credence to this whole system of always bettering yourself, of um, accepting failure as something that's positive, um, especially when you're going in the right direction. Uh, looking at just how you're impacting other people around you, you know, what your psychological state is. Um, these are all things that are important, not only in entrepreneurship, but also in professional development. Um, and then also, as we talk about following the brand, um, our brand is the infinity symbol. Um, and it's something that individuals can relate to across cultures, um, across backgrounds, uh, whether people have come from money or not. Um, and so I think it's, it's something that stands the test of time, something that is not anything that we invented, but it's a flag to say, uh, so to say that we're, we're bearing, you know, while we're passing through, um, you know, this lifetime. And so it is important, you know, how you brand yourself, what you uh, choose, what sim symbology you choose to represent yourself and your organization. Um, and thus far, the infinity symbol you know, has, uh, has taken us infinitely far. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we can't complain. Um, you know, we're really grateful for the experiences, you know, that, that we've had this far. I tell you, Ian, your story, uh, it uplifts me and it should uplift our community and, and uplift our audience uh, because you've gone through a lot of different um, journeys. And you're always looking forward. I can see that uh, in you. You're always looking, all right, what's next? What can I do next? You seem to have a very, very, very high aptitude for intelligence, uh, just to, to pick up things, look at them, turn them upside down, get outside the box, find the gaps that are there and, and fill them and, and create a uh, entrepreneurial spirit or monetizing that and then making it happen. Oh, we've had some conversations around some of the inventions that you guys are working with, which has been uh, very, very good. You, you're working with you know, different uh, uh, people at, at high-end Ivy League schools uh, and, and, and in, the, in the 
vaunted world of, of healthcare informatics, uh, which is in sorely of need of, of people of your caliber to be able to break the code, right? And make Absolutely. the experience much more um, relevant and talk to me about, so if you can, I don't know if you're under NDA or not, but talk to me because you had an application around COVID, which I thought was a phenomenon. And I, I want to see that progress. Can, can you talk about that? <laughs> sure. Um, so previously, our organization, um, well, well, first, I'll kind of talk about the progression, how we got there. So we essentially started working with artificial intelligence around 2015. So I was the first person to train IBM's Watson, um, which is the Watson supercomputer that won Jeopardy against the reigning champion um, a few, like a decade or two ago. And essentially, I was the first to train Watson how to recognize human emotion. And I didn't know back then that I was getting into um, informatics, right? I didn't know I was really getting into like medical imaging, so to say. Um, but that's kind of where things led. And so uh, one of the first presentations I did was about um, the Wizard of Oz and how the Wizard of Oz is actually from Omaha. And the wizard's purpose was to give the tin man a heart, right? Like that was one of the purposes. Um, and so I saw myself as the wizard. And I didn't think that it was a coincidence that out of all places in the world that the Wizard of Oz was originally a street magician in Omaha, Nebraska, right? And so, you know, that was empowering. Um, from there, we really looked at behavior health and we looked at depression because depression was such a huge factor towards poverty and violence, right? And, you know, if we could screen individuals for depression, we could ask more probing questions, right? Mm -hmm in order to get to find solutions to some of the challenges that we face. Um, then depression and anxiety, et cetera, brought us to uh, the common cold and flu. Um, and with the common cold and flu, you know, we really were basing that off of other work we had done as well in the cannabis space. And so we actually were brought into Colorado by a group of uh, growers and essentially they wanted our drone technology, right? Uh, in order to protect the crops um, from pestilence and, and um, viruses, et cetera. So I made a bet with, at the time, one of the largest growers in the country that our artificial intelligence could actually detect the difference in the variation between genetics. This episode is brought to you by Five Star BDM. Five Star BDM is a professional consulting and advisory group keenly focused on business development services for small to mid-sized businesses and entrepreneurs. Although every business is unique, they often share challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. Services include process improvement and operations, digital strategy and transformation, business intelligence, digital marketing, and personal branding. Our five-star business and personal branding company has helped a number of professionals and organizations to optimize and grow. The result is more business, more opportunities, better reach, positive outcomes. Please visit www.5starbdm.com to learn more and view all the episodes of Follow the Brand. right, with the strains, just using computer vision and imaging. So they didn't believe me. And then what happened is, is they, they allowed me to come to their facility and I took 10,000 images, right, with this camera, just 10,000. And then I built um, this artificial intelligence, this AI assistant, um, and this AI assistant was able to recognize um, strains of cannabis and forms of cannabis that they had never seen before. And so that gave us confidence to say, like, hey, it, it actually looked at genetics, right? Like, well, then if it could do that, then, then it can probably look at diseases as well. So then that brought us towards the common cold and flu. And then when COVID hit um, early 2020, I looked at 
what the CDC um, symptoms were. And the symptoms were very, very similar to the common cold and flu. And I said, hey, if we, if we were able to do the common cold and flu and to get algorithms that were bench testing at 100% accuracy, then we should be able to take on um, COVID. And so I essentially, I just drew out this picture of um, the, the S spike protein for COVID and I just put it on my wall, <laughs> right? And for months, I just started researching. And like I said, I don't have a medical background whatsoever. Um, and I don't even have a technical background, but I knew that there was something special about the outbreak. Uh, and so something just told me to go after it. And so first what I did was um, I essentially created an algorithm that could tell whether a person was just COVID positive or negative. Um, then re we did further research and we took about 60,000 different studies and we aggregated them. And what we found was that certain strains were dominant on certain continents. And then what we did was we found images of people who had been verified of being sick on these different continents. And then we screened them remotely in order to be able to detect the accuracy of our algorithm. And it was able to detect um, different strains instead of just looking for one strain, just COVID positive or negative, it was actually able to detect, uh, we got as many as four different strains. Um, and then after that, we started exploring about, well, can we detect a person that's sick, that's COVID positive in a crowd of people? And, and that's when we started working with what's called object detection, where instead of looking at a whole image, really what you're doing is you're parsing out pieces of that image for the AI to hone in on, so to say. Wait a minute, hold up. You're telling me that first you were looking at individuals to see if they were positive or negative, and you were getting you know, accurate results. And then now you can look at just the image of people in a crowd, and you could know who's positive and negative just by looking at the image? Exactly. So... What the estimate is, is that artificial intelligence has an IQ of about 10,000. And the smartest person, the smartest humans on average might have an IQ about of a 150, right? So also the AI is looking at things. Um, one, it's looking at body gestures. It's also looking at, uh, it's utilizing um, biomarkers. Uh, as well, which are predominantly used in the medical um, field. And then also one thing that's unique is it's really looking at spectral variation in light, right? How light bounces and reflects off of your skin. When you're sick, your light reflects off of your skin differently than when you're healthy, right? And the AI is able to pick up on that on a pixel level. And so it's able to see things that a human might miss um, but also is able to learn much more quickly. Um, throughout this process, we essentially created an AI engine, and this engine automates the entire process of creating artificial intelligence from beginning to end. And so it used to take us really years to develop this technology. Um, however, with the engine automating that, we can just talk to it, it goes, it fetches the data, it cleans it, uh, make sure that it's secure with cyber checks, et cetera. It trains itself to remember the data, and then it spits it out as a ready-to-go, one-clickable application. So we don't even have to take the AI and move. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to code at all in order to train this artificial intelligence on something that's new. Now um, I got a question for you, Ian, because you know we've heard of Alexa, we've heard of you know, Siri. You you talked about Watson. Does your AI have a name? Yes, it's called Forever. <laughs> forever forever ai yeah forever ai and it really started out like uh it's funny it started out as a um more of a tongue in cheek when you know i i remember making a comment on social media and i was just saying you know what i might take all of our algorithms and throw them together and name it forever right and that's essentially what i did i took all of our algorithms that we have been working on since 2015 16 and I put them all into one AI. 
And then we ended up partnering with uh, Amazon Web Services, and they gave us access to the most powerful um, graphics processor and server in the world, uh, the A100. And we had eight of them that were tied together, and we, we trained our artificial intelligence on um, those servers. And so our current commercial version um, has been trained on the most powerful systems available. Um, but we also have other experimental um, algorithms that we have that we're still developing as well. Well, you're doing some phenomenal, phenomenal work. I know that uh, some of the Ivy League schools are looking at your research, seeing if they can deploy it, and that uh, you know, you're working your way through to make this uh, commercially uh, available. I think you're stepping into an area. I have not heard of any other technology that could do anything like that, but I like how you touched on artificial intelligence. You talked about machine learning. You've talked about IoT, which is Internet of Things, or even Internet of Medical. Medical things, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Now you you know you're going to talk to our our association about robotic process automation. All these different things that are changing our world as we now start making that you know track toward uh, Web 3.0 and the virtual worlds and things like that. So our digital platform, our digital technology, is taking us on is taking us on a new journey. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's interesting. There's, you know, we, we, for the conference, one of the things that we'll touch on, but I won't go all the way into detail here is supply chain. And I was just reading an article today about how the oncology field, particularly in the United States is running out of, um, ink, right. Um, the ink that you utilize in order to dye or the dye uh, in order to color CT scans, to MRI scans, right? To look at the tissue variations. Um, so they're running out of this and they have to do half the amount of scans that they would normally do because they don't have access from a logistical um, and a supply chain standpoint. And so, you know, this, um, Clearly, there are, there are, are needs for the supply chain um, to be accelerated for certain technologies to not only be developed overseas, but for those to be developed locally so that we have local supplies uh, as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of organizations that are laying off across all sectors. And as a result, a lot of those people have skill sets that can be repurposed for manufacturing, right, and, and for developing and building some of these newer technologies, um, in the medical space, it's interesting because um, I'm trying to think about the phrase. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty medieval, right? Like uh, from that perspective, I mean, when you go in the hospital, the same instruments that I saw when I was little, right, like are still there, right? Like there's, you know, they don't, you know, they don't even really have, you know, they still got the old TVs, you know, things of that nature, right? Like with the video popping out. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that just hasn't necessarily changed. I know that there's not a lot of incentive for those things to change if you have large conglomerates that, you know, are making money, you know, based off of licenses for 25 years. However, our thought process is that um, with these new technologies, it's like the genie being out of the bottle, right? Like once it's out of the bottle, I mean, you can't really put it back in. Once people know about it, you know, somebody's going to pick up that flag. And so as a result, you know, our thought process is these larger companies really should work with these smaller companies um, in order to source the innovation. The larger companies can't move quick enough. Right. But also at the same time, I think that the smaller companies, it makes sense for them to partner with a lot of these larger companies as well um, in order to truly create something that not only has commercial viability, but also at the same time truly addresses the needs of the patients, right? And the medical community. And you, you need both, right? Like you need the big players in order to kind of make some things move, but also at the same time, you need the innovation that's, that's happening at the small business and the startup level that uh, essentially these organizations aren't going to be able to innovate fast enough to really compete with some of these technologies that may be disruptive. So let's just take an example with the layoffs. So with a lot of the layoffs, you're cutting talent. Mm -hmm. Now you're cutting ideas. Now that you have hiring freezes, now you're cutting the flow of ideas 
through your organization, right, et cetera. And so to a certain extent, they're going to become stale. They're not going to be as innovative and as quick-footed as they normally would be. And so now, from my perspective, you know, for a scrappy startup, you know, now was one of the best times to be able to get in the industry, uh, particularly the medical field, just because it is so ripe for um, for innovation and no, with for digital transformation. I like how you just said about the genie is out of the bottle. They said telehealth. Telehealth has been around for a while, but it wasn't widely adopted because they had to adopt it and it accelerated the use of the technology by 10 years. So you can imagine other technology that it's, it's already in the uh, in, in, in other industries, being used in finance, being used in hospitality, used in other fields, but not in healthcare. And healthcare would probably be a great adopter for it because of its model. I think you're onto something there. Now, I'm going to switch subjects right quick. Sure. I want to talk about, well, I'm going to bring this back around to you. And I want you to talk to our younger uh, African Americans and, and people of color that are not in tech or they are intimidated by by tech you know we've got stem programs <laughs> out there and i want oh, man. people to really get involved and so i want you to talk about what, what's your feelings around that oh man so this is a huge topic um very very big in the african-american community especially with those of us who are in tech that are black um or minority um or woman right um as well and so there's not a lot of diversity in tech and there's not a lot of diversity of um, capital that's deployed in, in the tech field as well, um, which definitely impacts, you know, the overall diversity of the field. Um, however, that hasn't necessarily stopped us from doing other things, right? Like learning to read, uh, going to school, right? Like, or running for mayor, right? Like, et cetera. So as a result, um, you know, I think it's important to not only learn how to create in the physical world, and and a lot of times you have a lot of my, minorities um, or women, etc., that that love to express themselves in the physical world, um, but it is just as important in the 21st century um, to learn how to express yourself digitally as well. Um, you know, you talk about branding, right? Like that's a that's a way of expression, but coding is also a way of expression. And so I definitely wanna encourage those people that have no experience with coding whatsoever. Um, I, you know, to be honest, I had no prior technical background. I never took any um, classes, et cetera. And the interesting part, I mean, outside of like learning um, like a typing class, right? Like, I mean, you know, in high school, I mean, that's pretty much it. And um, so today I was interviewing high school students in Colorado for cybersecurity internships. And a lot of those kids already knew, they were junior seniors, they already knew how to code in like one or two languages. Um, they already had cybersecurity certifications, things of that nature. And they're like 17, right? Like I didn't learn how to code until like, what? I was like 31, 32, I was like 32, right? And so, um, so I definitely encourage people to say that, you know, you can definitely take it on without any formal education. A lot of people don't want to go back to school, right? You don't have to go back to school. You can go online. You can look up YouTube tutorials, um, you know. And then also I encourage people, if they're going to learn it, the best way to learn it isn't necessarily through just tutorials. It's through actually building things. Like actually, you know, and I encourage all of our students, all of our apprentices, come up with a product that you want to push out right? That's all you. And actually go after it. Like, don't just, we're not, we're not playing. We're not creating mock, you know, a mock idea. Like this is a real idea that I want you to take and I want you to run with it. And everything that you're learning along the way, you're going to add that or not to your particular project, right? And then as you're working on your own project, because you have the passion and the enthusiasm for your own creation, then you're more likely to take that information that you're learning along the way and apply it. And the only way that you're really going to truly become proficient is through applying what you're learning and not just going to, to school in order to get the credentials, 
But when you get on the job, you actually can't build anything. Um, and so we're really pushing um, individuals that don't come from, um, you know, traditional technological backgrounds to not be afraid and to really run towards it and to understand that in technology, there's something for you there. I mean, you're working with it every single day. Um, we know how valuable, for example, if I took away your phone, right? Like you would go crazy, right? Something so important, we have no idea how it works. And we don't build them, we don't manufacture them, right? But, but we pay them money every month, right? Like, and so, you know, if, if we know that there are business models out there that are creating this uh, recurring revenue stream, that so many of us pour into all the time, then why are we not entering into those particular industries, uh, et cetera? Okay, what you just said there, I am so glad you, you said that. We're, we're going to wrap up here in a minute, is that we have so many children out there that are operating in these gaming worlds. And I realized earlier this year, it's like, wow, this new generation is so ready for this virtual world experience that we're about to get into. They're probably more trained and ready to actually operate in a metaverse more than any of you know people that are 40 and over, 30 and over or whatnot, because they've been utilizing the technology. They've been utilizing the technology. Now we can give them the creative aspect before, because right now what they're doing is that they're just interacting with the technology. But now we're going to show you actually how to create in the technology. And like you just said, once you just get familiar with it, like, oh, it's like working with a program, whether it's PowerPoint or Word or any of these other programs that, you know, you might readily use on a daily basis. It's just an app. The more you get familiar with it, the better you get. There's some geniuses out there in these, in these gaming worlds, doing esports and other things that you get them into uh, a true virtual machine experience they would be able to create, he's like, wow, here's, here's my business case because they're out of the box. And he's like, you know, I, I saw that on the last re-edition of you know, the last video game I was on. You know, all you got to do is this, this, and this. You know what? That's a real application. You follow Absolutely. Me? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, the unfortunate part about it is, is, is information and knowledge is power. And the knowledge isn't really being disseminated very widely or broadly. A lot of it has to do with how archaic our educational system is in the United States. Um, it was actually created by John Amos Comenius, who was a Czech national in the early 1600s. Um, they asked him to come and be one of the first presidents of Harvard, uh, which he turned down. And so our people aren't really necessarily uh, getting the information. However, you're correct as far as the talent and the diamonds actually being in the mind. And I say that because, for example, uh, in our in Omaha, there was a group of individuals uh, in the community that were rounded up um, by federal agencies because of uh, fraud that was ongoing with the PPP loans. Right. So it was a couple million dollars that ended up coming out of that. If that brilliant group of minds could have just been focused on the right things, such as technology right like why not create a tech startup and you can pull down the same amount of money and you might be able to pull it down just as quick depending upon how you wrap you know wrap the uh, present right and and then you have other people right like uh, those individuals that may be uh, in drug dealing etc and you know they they have to know all this knowledge about chemistry uh, etc those individuals have the mindsets to be able to go into some of these industries, where you don't need to have a four-year degree. You just need to come in with something that works, right? And that's, and that's all that they're asking for. And so I think that there's a huge opportunity. I think it's all just about communicating. And it's my hope to utilize platforms such as this uh, to tell people, you know, your, your babies, if you're going to teach them Spanish, they should be learning um, a programming language as well, right? I, I'm not even going to you. What you said there <laughs> that is so... <laughs> very, very true, and that we've got to really think outside of the box and understand it's our responsibility to educate our children. Exactly. Our responsibility to educate our children and, and educate them to be able to compete in this world, to excel in this world. You know, they were brought into this world for a reason. 
God-given ability. So let's use our talents. And I would say one more thing is that, in one word, entrepreneurship. If you own your own business, nobody can tell you no. You develop it, no one's going to say you need to have this certification, you need to have this degree. No, you don't. I know people that are entrepreneurs, they hire people with degrees, they hire people with certifications. You can do what you can do. It only costs a couple hundred dollars to get an LLC. Start your own business. I, I guarantee that you, you'll go far, especially if you have the drive and ambition, like Mr. Ian here, the drive and the ambition to move forward, no matter how you start. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. And you took all that Absolutely. passion and here you are now. So before I, I leave you, is there any last words you'd like to leave with the audience? Absolutely. Um, I think that as uh, Grant said, I think I think entrepreneurship is definitely the most important aspect because if we're creating things and we're not creating things that we can benefit off of or that our children can benefit off of or that our communities can benefit off of, then you know what is the point of existence, right? If we can't manifest things that are ultimately going to make our lives better as well as those around us. And entrepreneurship at its core is ownership. And without ownership, without owning and, and, and being able to turn your creations into assets, then, you know, we're really just behind the ball. And so, you know, it's my hope that, um, that I can inspire young people as well as um, those that may be mid-career and those that may be at the end of their career to actually uh, think about the field of technology and to think about the opportunities that exist, the low barriers to entry. All you need is a laptop and an internet connection to get in the game. And so hopefully, you know, my experience uh, can be encouraging to others that you don't have to have, you know, all these credentials, et cetera, uh, to really produce and to surpass those that may actually have credentials as well. I, I totally agree. And if the audience would like to get in touch with you, Ian, what, what is the best way? Um, so they can either reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Ian McHale, E-A-N, McHale, M-I-K-A-L-E. Um, they can also uh, contact me on um, on Instagram. They can find us on uh, Facebook, Infinite Day Institute. And then also they can go to our website, www.infinitedayinstitute.com. And that's Infinite Eight with the number eight. Well, this has been wonderful. I can't wait for our uh, event that's going to happen on June 23rd. We're going to get this aired right before that. So we can get, honest can get, the audience can get more familiar with you. This has been a treasure. And you everybody can tune in to all the episodes on follow the brand at www.5starbdm and that is b for brand d for development and m for masters.com till next time take care Ian. all right make sure you follow the brand thanks grant you're welcome